Chapter 22 Because race is real, and race matters. I'm not the one denying it, and neither are you. We are standing up and saying, of course black lives matter, but so do white lives, and all the other lives. And who among us can say that one life is more valuable than another? Well, I am proud of my heritage. I am proud of my culture. And I am attracted to our European standards of beauty. It is a simple fact that this instinctual attraction, this ethnic Pride means I value my racial brothers and sisters more than those who are not members of my race. And every other culture feels the same way because racial identity matters. A twat wearing those idiotic suspenders and, I shit you not, a goddamn top hat was stomping across the band shell stage. And I couldn't help but wonder if this was the mysterious Peter character. The alt-right anthems blaring from the speakers had been replaced with a soaring, patriotic instrumental that lent a sense of gravitas to the top-hatted twat's ranting. It was absurd, disingenuous, and blatantly offensive. And the crowd was eating it right up just the same. The tsunami of raw emotions was held back by an ebbing alcoholic dam that had sprung enough leaks to confirm the simmering rage of the gathered masses. They were standing ready, waiting for permission to explode. I'm talking about righteousness, godliness, and honoring the culture and heritage of Western civilization. What I'm talking about is no different from black culture, Asian culture, or Jewish culture. But because of the color of my skin, because I am white, this makes me some kind of unconscionable racist? Well, fuck that, and fuck the real racist pushing this agenda to oppress, subjugate, and eradicate the white man. Oh, they call it diversity and immigration. But who is writing those immigration policies? Who is actually controlling our borders? We see them prancing all over Washington, pushing this ugly and insipid white replacement conspiracy. The Jews will not stop until the white man has no power in our own homeland. They will not stop until we are reduced to useless fucking cucks. Pockets of the fired up crowd began chanting, Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! The twat in the top hat continued, and although we did not come here to commit acts of violence, we will not hesitate to defend our homeland. Because make no mistake, we are under invasion, and our very way of life is threatened by a rising tide of color brought on by those Washington and Hollywood Jews. But we will stand resolute, we will stand firm, and if the situation demands it, we will stand in violent defense, guided by those 14 words. As the asshole on the stage began reciting, the assholes in the crowd joined in. They were words printed across banners and signs throughout the rally. In some places, they were reduced to simply the number 14 blazoned across poster boards. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. The crowd erupted in cheers and whoops. Guns were fired into the sky and a pair of loud whooshes yanked my attention to the two idiots by the burn pit with the flamethrowers. They let off another set of blasts, and orange flames exploded skywards. Guns were dumb, but I'd be lying if those flamethrowers didn't inspire a moral exception, given the current circumstances. If I could get my hands on one, it's fair to say that righteous justice would never smell so crispy. I was doing my best to give the burn pit a wide berth, but it was unavoidable on our path to the base camp behind the band shell. We were close enough to feel the heat of the flames and smell the acrid odor of chemical-laden fabrics, plastics, and papers as they burned in the pit. As we navigated the crowd, I saw that they were burning Black Lives Matters flags in bulk. Flames consumed signs and banners bearing the flag of Israel and the Star of David. Anti-protester posters bubbled and curled in the heat. The ones that hadn't been charred unrecognizable proclaimed, Fuck fascism, Nazis go home, no gods, no master race, no KKK, no fascist USA. And then there were the books the racist cunts tossed into the flames, one right after the other. When a book didn't immediately catch fire, one of the assholes pointed a flamethrower and immediately roasted the shit out of it. There were Korans, Torahs, 
and any other blatantly non-Christian texts. Contemporary books were flung into the flames at a rate that would have made Josephine weep. Slaughterhouse Five, George, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, 1984, Catcher in the Rye, To Kill a Mockingbird, and all the other Nazi-related writing that didn't bend over backward to glorify Mein Fuhrer. If Josephine were here, she'd slap the flamethrowers right out of their hands and then give the assholes a lecture on censorship. Of course, if Josephine were here, she'd also be strung up in a noose and probably set on fire with one of those same flamethrowers at the rate these fuckers were going. Still, as book pages curled and disintegrated into ash and glowing embers floating in the heat, her past exhortations about book banning rattled in my head. If nothing else, the burn pit was a helpful distraction against my progressively leaky emotional dam as we pushed deeper into the rally. Josephine would have explained that the burn pit was a perfectly respectable, albeit extreme, form of political speech. Even though it inspired strong emotions, there was nothing inherently wrong about the burning and destruction of flags and protest signs, no matter what they represented, because it was just another form of expression. But once books were added to those flames, an unconscionable line was crossed. Books carried ideas, and the act of reading was a form of communication that spanned the spectrum from mild to extreme. To burn those books, destroying ideas because they don't align with your personal thoughts, beliefs, and ideology, wasn't simply an act of political speech. It was an outright censorship fueled by narrow-minded acts of oppression. Josephine liked to defend the concept of free speech, but looking around at these Nazi fuckheads, I couldn't help but think that every rule deserved an exception. Over there, Beckett said, gesturing to the line of trees that bordered the banshill. Behind that RV with Trump riding a tank painted across the side? Pretty fucking hard to miss. I think we can slip into the backstage area there, he said. There was a hole in the tree line just beyond the RV. I glanced back at the band shell and saw that the guns, body armor, and militia were clustered in a higher number the closer you got to the stage. Back in the direction of the RV, things looked somewhat less hazardous. I nodded at Beckett. Let's give it a go. As the top-hatted twat ranted his bullshit racist rhetoric, we scooted around the RV and found the unobserved hole among the line of trees. The brush beyond was thin, and once we got past the trees and crouched behind the bushes, the backstage area was easy to assess. There were three tow-behind trailers, a little larger than the one I called home back at the RV park. The one closest to the stage was hitched to a pickup truck. Across from the trailers were canopies with chairs and tables. One particular canopy had a bunch of people hunched over computers and phones. That's the Suns' social team, Beckett said, following my gaze. You should see their online operation. They probably give the Russians a run for their money. He hesitated and then rolled his eyes. You know, if they weren't all fighting for the same side. I grunted indifferently. Nerds on phones didn't bother me as much as the total lack of pretense the thugs backstage were strutting around with. Assault rifles were plentiful, body armor and flak jackets standard. Darkness had fallen, and the whole area was lit up with bright floodlights. My emotional dam was almost gone, and with the cacophony of the rally raging at my back, I felt a distinct tension radiating from the base camp. A measured excitement. Anticipation. Hunger. Find Peter or find the girl. I said, repeating Beckett's earlier marching orders. I nodded at the three trailers. Assuming the asshole in the top hat wasn't the man of the hour, any idea which one he's most likely in? Beckett let out a sigh of frustration. No, no, that guy was definitely not Peter, which makes this the shittiest game of three-card Monty. I raised an eyebrow at the kid, definitely not as dumb as he looked. These trailers have ladders on the back, I said. Usually, there's an exhaust fan or a skylight to peek through. Dude. Beckett frowned and waved his hand at me. What? I mean, uh, come on, he replied. 
You're huge. You can't possibly sneak across the roofs of three trailers without someone noticing. Shut up. I hissed. I'm sorry, but I clapped my hand over Beckett's mouth and pointed his head toward the stage. Three men were coming around the rear corner of the band shell. One was a gussied up alt-right militia member with an assault rifle at the ready. The other was Officer Samson in a shotgun. Walking between the escorts was Councilman White, still in that blue suit. They were heading for the trailers. For what it's worth, I whispered, the trick to three-card Monty is knowing how to cheat the cheater. Samson climbed the steps of the trailer hitched to the truck. Councilman White followed immediately after, closing the door behind him. The last thug was left to stand guard outside. All right, here we go. Welcome to the lion's den.